every field of academia, be it anthropology, philosophy, biology, physics, chemistry, whatever, all of them, all of them, share the fundamental goal of understanding and inducing alterations in the human consciousness. I'm a PhD postdoctoral researcher at Yale University. I'm uh, an assistant professor at Johns Hopkins. I'm a psychopharmacologist. I am a Master's of Divinity candidate at the Harvard Divinity School. The history of academia is rooted in tunnel vision. It's finding a single problem and addressing it with sort of blinders on. My dissertation area was Inuit shamanism. And my PhD is in psychology. I'm a psychotherapist with a practice in New York City. Co-principal investigator and director of palliative care for the NYU Psilocybin Cancer Anxiety Study at the NYU School of Medicine. You have a million people with their flashlights in the dark pointing at their one little spot. Interdisciplinariness is bringing everybody together to focus all of their lights on one spot. I'm a painter. I'm a co-founder of the Evolver Network. I'm doing a presentation on Hakeem Bay and Burning Man. I'm not an academic, uh, so I probably don't belong here, but I was a radical student in the late 60s. I double major in religious studies and philosophy with a minor in history. I've done a, a PhD at Sydney University over 10 years in anthropology. I have two PhDs, but who counts? The fact that over 300 people showed up to hear about this the fact that we had over 50 different presenters presenting at this event. I mean, that just goes to show how much information there is out there. People bought tickets from over 30 states and 10 foreign countries. People flew in from Thailand and Australia, England, so from all over the world. It was a global event. We are proud of the symposium format of this conference. These symposia have been carefully crafted to address issues important to our culture and our society. Each of these symposia, focusing on health, academics and research, innovation and ethics, has been assembled to bring together several perspectives to address those topics. There were two tracks of different lectures happening. Our poster session that was open throughout the conference, and simultaneously there was an art gallery we're sitting on the campus of one of the greatest institutions for the discovery and generation of knowledge and ideas in the whole world. The opportunity to hold this conference on the campus of an Ivy League university, America's first university actually, cannot be overstated. Our presenters come from around the country and from all varieties of fields. And together they provide an interdisciplinary perspective that is actually the pride and the ambition of the modern American university. So consider what that says about the future of psychedelic studies and psychedelics and culture. I'm a professor in the departments of psychiatry and neuroscience at Johns Hopkins. Um, I'm a psychopharmacologist, that is, I study the interaction of behaviorally active drugs and, and behavior, and I've been doing research preclinically and clinically for 40 years now at Hopkins. Uh, about 12 years ago, we initiated our studies, uh, human studies, with psilocybin, and that's been a really fascinating adventure to unfold. Because of the interdisciplinary focus of the conference, I saw a lot of scientists who I've heard speak elsewhere who, are, who might in other contexts be very focused on the data sets and kind of reporting the mechanical details of their research. Here, I saw a lot of them have more, a little bit more leeway in presenting what, th what they saw as the context of their work. And I thought, you know, doing psychedelic research is insane. It's not possible. It's a total career ender. Why would anyone do this? But you meet Charlie Grobe, and he said, you know, this is not going to ruin your career. He has a leadership position at Harvard. He's the division chief of child psychiatry. And he said, if you work within your institution, uh, this is doable. We have a couple of trials running uh, with targeting therapeutic applications. One of those is uh, looking at uh, psychologically distressed cancer patients who are have uh, either a terminal or a potentially life-threatening cancer diagnosis 
they're dealing with the existential anxiety of that diagnosis and the implications. To confront one's death and mortality, which we're all going to do, is a profoundly, um, potentially profoundly uh, terrifying experience. Only recently has the fields of palliative care and psycho-oncology and psychiatry begun to really address the psychosocial and spiritual and existential suffering that accompanies this kind of diagnosis. Uh, for years it was a very taboo topic. And it is the most avoided conversation in medicine that is caring for the dying. It's a topic people want to avoid for obvious reasons. This research really is, is a novel, one of the first uh, to have a real experiential uh, period and experience that potentially transforms one's idea about death, life, this body, cancer, consciousness. The big issue is, is his mental health about meaning or is it about medications? If we can really provide this sense of meaning, which is shown in the research to be a buffer against depression and improve quality of life at the end of life, it's an amazing uh, offer it to give these these patients so I think in that regard um, the medical community has been accepting of it because it's such a, a dire need this is distinct from a model in which the psychedelic agents are used as neuroscientific probes to understand how the brain works uh, or even in, in creativity studies uh, we are not doing shamanic work or neo shamanic healing that's a different set of principles ours is deeply embedded in a more Western uh, academically based psychiatry model the research then started speaking for itself. We had these remarkable reorganizational experiences that mapped onto naturally occurring mystical experiences, looking very much like the phenomenology that emerges in some meditation and prayer practices. The volunteer said, in my mind's eye, I felt myself instinctively taking on the posture of prayer in my head. I was on my knees, hands clasped in front of me, and I bowed to this force. I wasn't scared or threatened in any way. It was more about reverence. I was showing my respect. I was humbled and honored to be in this presence. The presence was a feeling, not something I saw or heard. I only felt it, but it felt more real than any reality I had ever experienced. And it was familiar place too. It was when I surrendered to this that I felt like I let go. I was gone, or should I say this earthly part of me was. It was still on the couch in some sort of suspended animation awaiting my return. I was in the void. This void had a strange and indescribable quality to it that there was nothing to it but this feeling of unconditional and undying love. It felt like my soul was basking in the feeling of this space. I have no idea how long it lasted. Time and space did not exist there and there was no way of tracking it. I would have thought that the music might remind me of the time, but at the point I felt like I was the music or the music was me or maybe that it was all different manifestations of this love feeling I found myself wrapped in. So that happened in Baltimore at a medical institution laying on a couch. And we see that over and over and over again. And so... <laughs> this research does you know, organize itself around uh, spiritual and religious constructs. Uh, one of the scales for, it, for the study is the, is the mysticism scale. And there are a number of um, items that you know, we think when they're endorsed uh, fulfill the, need, the, the requirements for a mystical experience. That mystical experience, uh, um, although it sounds a little loosey-goosey, actually has been well defined by psychologists in the psychology of religion. And it is comprised of several features, a sense of the interconnectedness of all things, that's a unity, a sense of sacredness, a sense that the experience is more real and more true than everyday waking consciousness, a sense of open-heartedness, love, positive mood, transcendence of time and space, and finally, uh, ineffability. People say, you know, I can't possibly put this experience into words. Mystical experiences of which, you know, strong psychedelic experiences when you do a fairly big dose tend to produce mystical experiences, which are experiences of union, of transcendence, of, you know, feeling that one is connected to all of the universe and that one understands, even though one can't express it verbally, um, everything. Of course, uh, psychedelics and psychoactive compounds are an excellent way of eliciting self-transcendence. They're very reliable, which is why we use them at Hopkins. Um, but uh, they're not, certainly not the only means of eliciting a self-transcendent or mystical type experience. Um, 
And so I had a lot of people who reported uh, these kinds of experiences while they were doing yoga, meditating, or going on retreats. That can be very deeply healing on a personal level. It can be really wonderful. It can make people less afraid of death. It can make them expand their ecological consciousness. It can make them more compassionate. Then the thought is that these kinds of mystical type experiences or experiences of profound insight may have uh, important therapeutic effects. And the fact that uh, we're getting a positive signal fits very nicely with older work done in the 50s and 60s, looking at mostly LSD and cancer patients. My husband is an employee here at the VA, and he told me that they were looking for normal people, and uh, I volunteered. 100 gamma of LSD-25, one-tenth of a milligram, the equivalent of one-six-hundredth of a grain. The dimensions and all the, the prisms and the rays and, and everything coming down through you and, and moving. I wish I could talk in technicolor or, or, or let you see. Can you, did you say you can see it? No, I can't quite see it. Tell me about it. I can't tell you about it. If you can't see it, then you'll just never know it. I feel sorry for you. <laughs> the narrative that a lot of people understand is that we had the, you know, the psychedelic 60s and then government regulations made it very hard for people to conduct legitimate research on psychedelics and everything having to do with it was sort of pushed into the underground. And so if you wanted to talk about psychedelics, and you were serious about doing so, um, you had to do so outside of, you know, an academic setting. History shows that we have always used drugs. In every age, in every part of this planet, people have pursued intoxication with plant drugs, alcohol, and other mind-altering substances. I've done a book demonstrating that a considerable series of Jewish and Christian commentators had secretly considered manna psychoactive. And we do have psychoactive mushrooms occasionally portrayed in medieval church art, including Amanita muscaria as the forbidden fruit of biblical Eden. In the early Elizabethan period, we have the same motif in an alchemical text. In 1829, Eusebe Salvert published Des Sciences Occultes. Salvert devoted a full chapter to the use of psychoactive drugs in occult initiations, including, for example, the Eleusinian Mysteries. Albert Hoffman was looking for a drug that would be some sort of aid in childbirth to improving the outcomes of childbirth for the mother in labor, and incidentally, uh, synthesized a compound that had profound effects on perception, consciousness, awareness, that in itself was sort of an accidental discovery. This is Charles Savage. He published the first study on using LSD to treat depression in 1952. Henry Beecher, the chaired professor of anesthesiology at Harvard, was doing work on LSD as a control drug uh, in his anesthesiology experiments at Mass General. One of the most interesting little stories of the 1950s research is, a, is about the partnership of three men, Aldous Huxley, Gerald Hurd, and Bill Wilson, who is the co-founder of Alcoholics Anonymous. Bill Wilson did a lot of experimentation with LSD to see if LSD could be used to help alcoholics have the spiritual experience that is necessary in the 12-step program. He wrote to Carl Jung, the Swiss psychologist, in, in, in 1961, where he says, AA usually has about a 5% success rate normally, and he said, but if these alcoholics are first preconditioned with LSD and then placed in the surrounding AA group, the result is startling. Gary Fisher did research with autistic children in the 1960s with, with mixed results, um, but some with very profound results. Loretta Bender of the Bender Gestalt um, test was a famous child psychiatrist at NYU. And amazingly, uh, back in the late 50s, early 60s, when LSD was part 
of American Psychiatry, actually for over 25 years. She gave um, LSD to autistic kids and schizophrenic kids, about 50 of them. And this was done at Bellevue Hospital. Leary's mentor at Harvard, uh, who actually happened to have been one of my father's best friends. My father was, I mentioned, a psychiatrist. I knew Henry Murray when I was a kid. He was the epitome of the Harvard Blue Blood professor. He wore three-piece suits. He was very elegant, very dignified, very important personality. Uh, himself in the history of psychology, he was a, the first really important personality theorist. And he was the supervisor of Timothy Leary's psilocybin studies from 61 to 63. He was working with prisoners, trying to see if psilocybin experiences could help with recidivism rates, but some were concerned about um, the time frames he was using to determine his statistics. I think the big problems happened closer to home at Harvard, where his lab was giving psychedelics to undergraduates. Some people think it was just the topic that caused him to be kicked out of Harvard, but it was really the way he went about doing the research. There were lots of colleagues in psychiatry, my father's in the late 50s and early 60s in the US and the UK, and in Central Europe who were interested in LSD as uh, part of psychotherapy. Um, that all ended in 1966, 67, when the drug was rescheduled and the DEA, uh, as of 1970, decided that LSD had no therapeutic benefit. Among current researchers, especially ones who are younger, there's a thing, well, the 60s really blew it for us because Tim Leary really was being irresponsible and, you know. Uh, and, you know, that's fair and it's not fair because on one level, if you think about all movements when they're born or when they're early, the early feminist movement, at least in its modern form, uh, the black, black power movement, movements that have been suppressed a long time, like a lot of Shia Islam is now, in their first eruption when they've been held down, they're excessive. So. Yes, it did kind of blow it for research, but I think that I'm not sure it's the Tim Leary's and the people who sort of overdid it with the research at Harvard. I think that the repression against the, the 60s in every sense, you know, the civil rights movement, the feminist movement, the ecological movement was going to come because so much had happened and, and societies are a bit like human beings. You know, if you have an excess of energy, you've got to go sleep. And so what happens is that periods of, to use Terence's term, of eruptions of novelty are followed by periods of, you know, conservative reaction. So this guy named Nixon, I know some of you may remember him, he realized that he was facing what was essentially a political war of ideology with the SDS, the student movement, the Black Panthers and such. And he realized that he couldn't fight them on the face of their political beliefs because we're America. Freedom of speech, freedom of belief. How can you tell somebody that they can't be socialist or communist or this or that when they're supposed to be a free country? But he realized that this revolution, this young revolution, this student revolution, this black revolution, it had another component to it, which was that they were avowed users of drugs. And he realized, and his tape transcriptions confirmed this years later, that if you criminalized their behavior, so in other words, if you criminalize their use of drugs, then you could use that as a pretext to undermine the movement. And that's exactly what they did. There's a lot of fear of people thinking differently in general and to see the world differently. And I think that in many cases, the powers that be wanted to maintain the status quo and psychedelics are not very good at supporting any status quo. These are some programs from the Marlene Dobkin de Rios papers. She's a medical anthropologist. These are from the quiet time between 1970 and 1990. So even though there wasn't a lot of hard research going on, it's still nice to see what was going on. Rick Straussman really started everything off in the early 90s and he provoked the FDA NIDA to have this historic meeting to say that there's nothing in the law that prevents this if people want to do it and they have good protocols and credentials, we're gonna let it happen and they've been doing that ever since. In the past 10 years, peer-reviewed un university research has begun to report empirical data about psychedelic-induced altered states of consciousness. And the purpose is twofold. One is to heal the suffering that's caused by cancer and the fear of death. And the other is to reanimate a discourse, a discourse that was silenced and discredited for the last 30 years. And this is the discourse on psychedelics as a tool for human growth and transformation. The 2006 Supreme Court case, uh, UDV uh, case, that affirmed the legal right of the UDV to use ayahuasca, and that was an eight to zero ruling. John Roberts wrote it, and I was 
really um, remarkable to me that a certain group of individuals, and we spoke about this earlier, can legally use these drugs, but if you're not in this religious construct, it's, um, it's illegal. And I just found that uh, very schizophrenic and fascinating. Um, <laughs> try to wrap my head around that. A lot of the science now, all of it that's coming out is meticulous in terms of their methodology, making sure that they've done all the background toxicology reports. They have protocols for exactly how the studies are going to be carried out, who's going to do what, at what time intervals. And so it's all very spelled out and very carefully recorded and watched by you know all of the relevant authorities. We now have run over 150 different volunteers, uh, over 350 sessions at Hopkins. We've never had uh, a, a really clinically significant adverse event. Hopkins has been able to show us that you can do this with um, multiple different studies and that it's, uh, if you properly screen people, that's a very large number and they've been able to establish in the modern era the safe way to administer these drugs. And we're finding that as well, UCLA is finding that, that uh, these drugs are safe and are able to be administered in human laboratory settings in academic medical centers. There are certainly many people who express an interest or a desire to participate in this study. We have pretty rigorous exclusion criteria. We conduct a very thorough psychiatric interview. We want people to have the strength within them to be able to confront, to experience and explore whatever happens during the study for them. The position throughout the day is reclining, ideally with eye shades and headphones and guides who are sometimes immediately present in a supportive, nurturing and safe way to really encourage the volunteer to just continue to trust, let go, go inward, move into the experience no matter how terrifying or alien it may be. People are reporting long-term changes positive changes in attitudes, moods, and behaviors. A lot of pro-social kinds of attitudinal changes. People feel more of service to others. They feel more loving, compassionate, attentive, and sensitive. So we're getting um, positive feedback, not just from the patients themselves, which that's often considered like biased self-report, but we're getting these kind of behavioral outcomes from uh, from other sources. Part of our protocol is that not only do we administer the psilocybin to people um, and then see what they say about it and, and measure their personality before and after and stuff, but we talk to their loved ones, their wives, the people they live with. Like we call them up and they're like, so, you know, how's John doing now as compared to before he took the psilocybin? We get these, uh, these testimonials from other people from outside being like, he's much kinder, he's much more patient, he's a lot less uh, angry with the kids. Showing the sustained effects in our 14-month follow-up data. Psilocybin compared to methylphenidate on the initial session, mystical experience goes up, stays right there when we ask them over a year later. We have a second kind of therapeutic uh, program running right now. It's a pilot study investigating whether psilocybin uh, can facilitate cognitive behavior therapy for cigarette smoking cessation. So this is addiction treatment. Can these insightful experiences, mystical type experiences, be leveraged and used uh, to um, occasion radical behavioral change? And so far, so good. We've run five volunteers. Most of our volunteers in the smoking pilot study remain completely abstinent. We have this very real behavioral intent, you know, it's not just creating this experience, but ultimately we're using it, leveraging it to help you quit smoking. But even in that, it's, we're not bringing explicit focus to talking about their smoking during the psilocybin session. I think importantly, we, we're sticking with what works and, you know, providing the safe container, you know, both physically and interpersonally, and then allowing allowing it to happen. The final application, therapeutic application, that we hope to start up in the near future is looking at psilocybin as a treatment uh, for uh, depressed patients who have been resistant to other forms of uh, antidepressant medication. And here, this is not really using psilocybin as an antidepressant per se, but the question is, 
would a reorganizational experience of this sort uh, alter fundamentally uh, the nature of the depressive episode and the nature of the depressive process. When you talk about this one out of five, one out of four Americans taking their daily dose, I always, I always sort of compare it to sweeping dirt under the carpet. You know, you take your antidepressant and you feel a little bit better, but you're not necessarily dealing with some of the core issues which are creating the misery. And, you know, as opposed to sweeping the dirt under the carpet, um, you know, psychedelics sort of encourage you to take the rug out back and beat the hell out of it. Um, and, you know, that's how I prefer to clean my house. We're hoping to get started this pilot study of people with major depression who have not responded to other treatments and looking at kind of the relationship between taking a serotonin agonist like psilocybin and looking at downstream effects on other neurotransmitter systems in vivo in the brain um, from before to after a high dose session. It's been shown in models that the effects on serotonin upregulate uh, glutamate. Uh, there's a researcher at Yale Agajanian who's formulated this glutamatergic serotonergic common hypothesis, but it's this increase in glutamate transmission throughout the cortex that's the real key to the effects. There's a lot of promise in developing tools to study selectivity at the serotonin 2 receptors. Drugs, if they are selective for 2A over 2C, will have a lot of promise in research for determining the roles of those respective receptors in the psychedelic experience or a variety of psychotic processes and disorders in the brain. When do you think these treatments that you are working on right now can be made available to public, and what are the challenges that wait ahead? We uh, at Hopkins and the NYU group are working on what amount to uh, phase two studies, and uh, we expect those to be done in a couple of years. At that, at that juncture, we'll meet with FDA, uh, present that data to them, and uh, design a, a phase three study if those, if those data look convincing. I think best case scenario would be uh, several years after that because the uh, phase three study is a big multi-site uh, clinical trial. So we're, we're still looking uh, five, seven, ten years down the road. Establish a model for a post-rescheduling world because if psilocybin becomes rescheduled from uh, one to two, then there's going to be a question, who can prescribe it? How will they prescribe it? What do you need to know to be a prescriber of it? How do you do it safely? How do you pick subjects for, uh, you know, in the, to participate in the study? How do you exclude people? How do you do integration work? All of this needs to be uh, taught in some way. And in an ongoing way, we're trying to learn how to teach it at the same time as learning how to do it. It really does create a bit of a quandary because um, the most ethical thing to do is to treat people with the most powerful, most effective um, tool available, medicine available. And for many reasons, for many applications, psychedelics are, I believe they are and are showing themselves through current research to, to be um, the most effective method, safe and effective method available. And so it becomes increasingly unethical for clinicians not to use psychedelics in their practice. People are clearly hurting and they're not getting the care they need. You know, for the first time in history, psychiatric disability claims are dwarfing physical disability claims. In particular, our country's veterans are getting shortchanged. And then there's this insane statistic Um, so an American veteran kills himself every 80 minutes. Eighteen veterans a day are killing themselves. And um, I just, I want to understand how you can ethically defend denying American soldiers medicines that may very well ease their pain. Yeah. Um, MDMA-assisted psychotherapy is developing a track record of impressive improvements in PTSD symptoms. And um, high CBD strains of cannabis may also have a role in ameliorating these symptoms. But there is currently a bit of red tape. I want all of us to pay attention to how government cooperation or obstruction affects vulnerable patient groups. And when you talk about research ethics, this is where you should start. 
Ethics is the arm of philosophy that deals with ideas concerning how we ought to do things, how we ought to form societies, how we ought to make laws, whether or not we should do a particular action. Failure to offer an available therapy um, that has been proven to be effective would violate the basic ethical principle of non-malfeasance, which pro prohibits the infliction of harm, injury, or death, and is related to the maxim primum non nocere, uh, which is basically above all do no harm. I've been looking for someone to provide me with the justifications on why it's morally permissible to keep entheogens illegal. I was working on what is called an argument by analogy uh, uh, for the legalization of various entheogens using the arguments for medical marijuana. We're talking about the ethical, legal, and social issues of enhancing the human potential through things like pharmaceuticals, through even steroids. And so I'm proposing that uh, psychedelic research shows that there's a whole different paradigm of human enhancement. It's more based on personal development, development of spirituality, morality, insight, altruism, these kinds of things. And we see that coming out of biomedical research. We see that in literature, um, back to Aldous Huxley. We see that in psychology, anthropology, and even art. And you can't have a bioethical discussion without talking about the umbrella term here, which is dignity. And I think that's a term that's probably very important to this movement, to this conversation today. So respecting the dignity of people to make their own choices, even if we might not necessarily agree with them. As a bioethicist, I can understand that spirituality of all kinds needs to be represented and reflected. So one of the questions I have, and that maybe we can talk about is, how integral is spirituality and quality of life, and should it become more of a primary focus when we talk about these issues and perhaps the possible uses of psychedelics with medicine and end-of-life care? And how are we gonna prove this? How are we gonna take it to the DEA and, and show our IRBs that we can do research on this? Should we standardize it because it's a plant substance, we want it all to be the same? To tell the truth, I don't think those questions are actually very helpful or very interesting, and I think we could ask bigger questions. If people wanna try to legitimize and argue for the use of ayahuasca, what, what role does health actually play in that? What role do doctors have in this to begin with? Do we want to say that this is something that causes um, harms and benefits like a regular medicine, or do we want to say this is something else that should be regulated maybe in a different fashion? There's also a parallel with the, the, the you know, LGBT movement, gay rights movement, because being a psychedelic person is a non-normative form of identification. It used to be illegal to be gay, and there used to be a lot more persecution. You can identify as being a psychedelic person. You know, that doesn't mean that you're taking acid every day. It could just mean that you had an experience in the past that has really shaped the way that you view reality so it's not it's not a matter of identifying with illegal practices but it's a, it's a way of viewing the world and now as a friend of mine was pointing out it's no longer socially acceptable to be overtly homophobic so that's come a, a long way but it still is illegal to take psychedelics and there is still a lot of stigma around it so why should profound self-motivated experiences into altered states of consciousness, psychedelic experiences, be considered taboo? Could it just be inertia of bad information? Academia, a bastion for getting to the bottom of taboo ideas, must hold a place for psychedelics. For the pursuit of academia and of human life hinges on alterations of consciousness, and these substances we know induce profound states of altered consciousness, and academia has the obligation as institutions of knowledge to understand them. My interest is not in psychedelics, um, generally. My interest is in the sacred plants as they are used in indigenous ceremonial contexts. Going back to ethnologies and, and other studies of how ayahuasca is used around the world, um, there are many different uses for this uh, brew. Um, one of them is healing, but other things include other sorts of shamanic practices, things like um, spirit travel, finding lost objects, uh, love potions, uh, good luck charms, improving hunting. The idea of ayahuasca healing has led to a number of uh, treatment centers which have popped up in countries where ayahuasca use as a, as a medicine is legal. Using ayahuasca with other types of therapy to treat drug addicts. 
Another thing that comes up quite a bit is the use of ayahuasca to treat depression, anxiety, similar to presentations we've heard about psilocybin uh, this past weekend. As much as I'd like to see more studies done with ayahuasca and its healing properties, it's hard to really take that out of the context of working with the ayahuascaro and what that ayahuascaro brings through the training and the lineage and the ikaros and the songs and, and the spirits. At the start of every ayahuasca ceremony, my maestro ayahuascaro, Don Roberto, goes around the room putting agua de florida cologne in cross patterns on the forehead, chest, and back of each participant. As he does this, he blows smoke from the powerful tobacco called mapacho into the crown of the head and over the entire body of each participant, and he whistles a special song of protection called an arcana. It is intention abstracted from human language. The wordless whistling of the protective song approximates instead to what he calls puro sonido, pure sound, which is the language of the plants. I hope we can hold space for this and what I'm talking about, because this is very sacred. Because the being is in the abdomen. So my being, he incorporates it. And the guy facilitating comes over, and he's, the being just starts like, fuck you. Fuck you all! I'm gonna kill you! And how does the facilitator respond? Welcome, brother! Welcome! Welcome for your healing. We're so glad you came. Tons of people were incorporating dark beings. It wasn't just me. And afterwards, I heard them saying, Oh my gosh, this is the anxiety. I finally got to hear him talk. This is my eating disorder. This is my anger management problem. This is why I'm so isolated. It's like you get to meet the spirit that's been messing with you. I have an understanding and an experience that it's not just the compound. It also very much has to do with, with the ikaros or the hymns that are sung, as well as with the beings that are called in. Like, is that addressed at all within the studies that you were speaking of and what might be done? Sure, so I didn't, I didn't mean to imply that when sort of psychiatric neuroscientific studies with ayahuasca or ayahuasca components are done that it's only the plants or only the substance. Um, the researchers I know who have been working with these compounds make efforts to include some sort of context. They're very aware that there are other um, things that can influence the outcome of, of this experience. But at least the work that's being done in, in Brazil, there are attempts to include sort of sometimes religious imagery if you want to study a religious state caused by that substance. And so you'll allow people to see a picture of like a prophet in order to get them closer to a state like being in a ritual setting in a church, mm -hmm. if you actually want to study what that rel religious experience in a church could be like, but you're in an fMRI machine, you're not in a church. The important factor about shamanism is healing people psychologically and physically through altering their consciousness, through getting them to purge their desires for created things, getting them to purge their, uh, their, their, their unhappiness and their doubts and their depression. Sometimes people are taken into absolute ecstatic states. Sometimes they're taken into the deepest, darkest hell that they have avoided all their life. Both are equally healing. A number of indigenous languages don't have the verb to be. I tell you that because the absence of that verb, if one is willing to contemplate it, will begin to unravel for a person the extent of differences in worldview between somebody that comes from America and somebody that is from a, a mestizo indigenous culture in Amazonia. And people kind of want to project this kind of primitive nostalgia is one of the common academic terms um, onto indigenous people. What does that mean? Well, it means that we are looking for something that doesn't exist and potentially at the expense of another group of people with a, with a different life way. Ayahuasca tourism, people coming from outside of Peru going to use ayahuasca to heal themselves of cancer, of some sort of spiritual affliction, has really popularized the idea that ayahuasca is a medicine. You go to a center, you're a patient, the doctor, the doctorcito, gives you this medicine, you take it and you become healed.
it's done away a little bit with the paradigm that the shaman actually drinks ayahuasca and finds a cure for the patient and then it um, brings that cure to the patient. Often the patient themselves, if they see themselves as a patient or a client, they are drinking the tea because it's a medicine and we know that patients take medicines, that the doctor doesn't take medicine. So we're seeing a sort of medicalization of ayahuasca use in this context. Our current medical paradigm is allopathic. This is a philosophy of healing that proposes that by treating the symptoms of a disease, whether surgically or pharmaceutically, we will eliminate the disease itself. It views illness, injury, disease, and death as abnormal and only a condition to be fixed. But it does not acknowledge that it can be the effect of these conditions that offer the potential for transformation in our lives. It's also important to recognize that this is only one philosophy of medicine. There are many others, homeopathy, osteopathy, naturopathy, chiropractic, Ayurveda, shamanism, traditional Chinese medicine, just to name a few. You don't stir the colors of the rainbow together. If somebody's going to carry multiple lineages, they have a responsibility to maintain the integrity of each particular lineage. And there's a, you know, a way in which they are in conversation with each other. But if somebody is doing an ayahuasca ceremony that comes from, from the Quechua tradition in Peru or in Ecuador, um, that ceremony needs to remain intact as much as possible and if new components are going to come in um, it needs to be done with great care and great consideration now we do not ourselves need to be embedded in the ambiguous and perilous shamanic tradition of the upper amazon to recognize the power of these beliefs as metaphor what the protective ceremony is saying is this. You cannot be a tourist among the spirits. Recently, there was a death in the ayahuasca community of a young man of 18 years old, Kyle Nolan. And a lot of people are speculating as to why that happened. First of all, nobody knows why that young man died. Speculation has, has ranged over uh, a lot of possibilities, including uh, the aspiration of vomit, including some kind of adverse reaction to any of several plants in the genus Brookmansia that is very rich in scopolamine. Simply to a failure of supervision where the young man wandered off into the jungle and fell, um, and we'll know more after the autopsy. How can we properly prepare people for participating in this kind of experience? And is it possible to prevent um, a psychiatric episode or um, something that's going to cause the person more harm than good? Not everybody is a candidate for working with entheogens. And whoever the facilitator is needs to know how to determine that that either psychologically or medically, they just may not be good candidates. I don't know in this situation if that was done. As to how to prevent it, I think people need to be smarter consumers. And I am also proposing an idea that we try to set up some kind of an independent certifying outfit. For example, there should be somebody on site at all times who is at least certified as a wilderness first responder. The site should have uh, written protocols for all foreseeable emergencies, including evacuation protocols. Um, there should be criteria for the facilities carrying appropriate liability insurance. And so then just have a list on a website of those centers that have submitted written materials and have allowed an inspection of their facilities so that people can look at that and make informed decisions about where they want to go. This is sounding a lot like what we do. <laughs> <laughs> This is where the duality breaks down. Yes. Safety is number one. That's right. <laughs> we have, as a subculture, to make it sound a little less groovy and to really explain to people what the real risks are. And I wasn't surprised to hear about that young man who died a few, a few weeks ago in, in Peru, because so many more people are doing this now, and inevitably some people are going to die in the process. As people die of heart attacks playing basketball. We're not going to outlaw basketball. But nonetheless, these substances have risks. I don't think there are physical risks with something like psilocybin. It's not toxic, but it, it is uh, on the psycho psychological and psycho-spiritual level, it can be profoundly disorienting. These things present some of the most existentially challenging questions, implications, uh, 
spaces that you could ever find yourself in. We have uh, volunteers who are, are carefully selected, carefully prepared, and they're carefully monitored, and yet we have a 30% rate of these potentially difficult experiences. It's not hard to imagine that administration of these compounds under unsupervised uh, conditions could lead to people to engaging in panic reactions or fearful reactions in which they could put themselves or others uh, in harm's way. Psychedelics are such powerful tools. I think of them almost like a, like a sharp scalpel. And here we are with all these kids running around at raves in the dark dancing with very sharp scalpels. And what do you know, people are getting hurt. Yet the same sharp scalpel in the hands of a skilled surgeon uh, who uses it with maturity, training, and intention can save lives. The set and setting, as everyone knows, is very important. But it's, these substances are for the right person at the right time, in the right place, in the right way. People will use these substances regardless of if there's accurate information or not. And so a major tenet of the DMT Nexus is focusing and working towards harm reduction. We've heard a lot of uh, people talking about their experiences before the internet existed, before there was all of this information that, you know, they would get their hands on some of these more potent compounds or, or plant materials and suddenly have experiences that they were completely unprepared for. experiences are electrical impulses and the chemical reactions in our brain. And so for me, obviously the, the most important canvas that I can ever display an image is within the context of your imagination. Even if this is nothing more than neurochemical art, this art is some of the most amazing, profound, beautiful things that we could ever experience. And I think that as human beings, when we examine our existential nature questions reality, what is the purpose of this? What is the meaning to our experience on this planet? Art factors in in a major way. And so even if that is the most basic sort of aspect of it, I think it's still beautiful and I think it's still every bit worthwhile as pretty much any other form of art. The work of art, is something primary. It has a life. For you, the event is inside yourself. If we have any lesson from experience with psychotropic agents, it would be that our worlds are radically singular. They're radically themselves. Artists tend to be very suspicious of academia and, and of that kind of labeling and categorizing. But also, academe is a place where you're provided with tools uh, for interpreting art, for exactly. thinking about art. So I learned a la prima painting, I went to medical school, I dissected uh, cadavers to learn my anatomy, I went through all the traditional steps of light, form, color, value, tone and shapes. The academic knowledge that I had um, and kind of the synergy with these new transcendental experiences um, together, the synthesis of that is kind of the basis of, of my art. Around 1965, uh, it, things really changed. You started seeing installation art, video came into the picture. The uh, art historians throw up their hands and say, well, we'll call it pluralism. My art relates to the psychedelic space and psychedelic ideas because pretty much everything on here has been at least inspired by a psychedelic mindset. So taking this African tradition of ritual dance, I invented these masks, these characters. For example, the second mask here is the battle between the classical tradition and the Gothic tradition, which was going on in the 14th century, in the 15th century, and I personified that as the Sphinx. We decided that we would build a 60-foot dome <laughs> and fill it with the most amazing art we could find. It became a really massive safe space and a hub for a lot of people to come, whether they were on psychedelics or just wanted to paint or communicate about what they're feeling. This is a picture of Amanda Sage doing some live painting. As an established artist, to be able to paint live in a very 
chaotic situation <laughs> and actually come out with something really beautiful, that's a true art form. The artist can really go inside and bring back images that, that offer something really complementary to life, something that's very uplifting and something that really draws upon the spontaneous spiritual experience. Religions are all founded on, at one time, spontaneous spiritual experiences. Art is, art is like language, or in fact, art is language. One person creating something, going out to other people that is understood in some way by those other people and acted upon, and it has a transformative or it has an enriching or it has a pleasurable impact in that person's experience. All right, that's, that's one of the ways that we characterize language. <laughs> Okay, now, <laughs> we all get extra extraordinarily confused on subjects which are actually the main subjects of philosophical inquiry in, in not only academia, but in the, in the history of the world. As a philosophy student and a hopeful future college professor, my question is, how do you think we could make this type of study or research more rigorous in the field of philosophy? The most common thing you would hear is nobody's ever said anything intelligent about consciousness, so don't even, don't even begin to do it. Talk about cognitivity. Talk about the content of, of uh, cognitive process. Talk about logic. Talk about the relationship between um, more uh, scientific aspects of psychology to um, epistemological issues. Talk epistemology, but don't talk about ontology unless you're German. This guy Chalmers, I think it's David Chalmers, who wrote this book about consciousness, what he did is he entered entirely into the language of cognitive science and found a way of challenging the entire suppositions of, of that, that discipline about the nature of consciousness. And it really has changed the discourse. People argue with him, people raise it. So now there's the thing that's called the hard problem. And the hard problem is, what is consciousness? There is a, a very you know, vibrant field in the philosophy of mind um, and in metaphysics. Um, and you know, when we talk about consciousness in a philosophical standpoint, we get right into that question of what is the mind, what is the, the, the interaction between mind and brain, are they separate? That takes us right on through to the age old question of the explanatory gap between the mental and the physical. What is objective and what is observable in the scientific sense? is incommensurable with what is intuitive and subjective. So the idea of something that is a pill that is mind manifesting, psychedelic, violates body-soul dualism and all the philosophic and, and religious assumptions predicated on the radical separation of body and mind. So actually, I'd like to speak to that a little bit because I think a lot of people in the psychedelic community are too satisfied and go too easy with, on the one hand, they're Buddhists and they believe in non-duality and there's no difference between neurological phenomena and, and conscious phenomena. Um, on the other hand, they, to, they, have, they have to deal with, you have to deal with, the fact that these states are produced by chemical means, which is very materialistic. If consciousness is one of the greatest mysteries, or as I think possibly the greatest mystery, and really beyond our comprehension, then how can we understand what higher consciousness is if we don't even get the regular deal? <laughs> and so how do then mystical experiences, psychedelic experiences, and our regular, everyday, more familiar forms of experience relate to each other? I think the philosophy of Alfred North Whitehead and his ontological ideas could be utilized to decipher the psychedelic experience. For him, the entire universe is one interrelated activity or process. At the end of the day, it's a more sophisticated way of talking about how all is one. Now, we already know that Hegel claimed that mind is absolute and that we are the being in which mind is coming to consciousness of itself. So to be able to understand how mind can be absolute and yet particularized into an individual human being we need an ontology like this. The bridge needs to be basically made between the science that everyone has kind of accepted as this is the truth and this is what we, um, this is what we kind of design our medical system around and the profound consciousness changing 
dimension and you can talk about vibration and love and all of these things but bringing it back to kind of the, the molecules themselves. The new study that we're hoping to get started very soon will be recruiting long-term meditators to, um, to ingest psilocybin at different doses, um, both outside and inside the, um, the, the, the magnet, the brain scanner. Investigating seriously the, the, the question of the relationship between mind and body, between consciousness and neurology, it's unresolved as much as we'd like to uh, crucify Descartes and about banish him from our consciousness. Nobody has actually developed an epistemological picture that overcomes Cartesian dualism. Everybody wants to. It's not just psychedelic people who want to overcome Cartesian dualism. The entire of existential uh, philosophy, phenomenology, postmodern um, Derridian uh, deconstructionists all want to get rid of that dualism, but nobody's really done it. The assumption is that everything in the universe can be put into just one of these two buckets. If it's not real, it's unreal. But I think like most of the European dichotomies that we have inherited, we need to subvert this. Yeah, none of these models were proven false. It's not like the psychological model was proven false by the spiritual model, was proven wrong by the shamanic model, will be ever proven wrong by the information processing model. And as psychedelic explorers, I think we need to collect these models rather than trying to choose between them. It's fascinating to think that the mind is truly this kind of transcendent, free essence of the universe, something that, which is even more fascinating in terms of the human experience, the mind is coming to consciousness of itself. And so the psychedelic experience is particularly fascinating because it's as if you can balance both worlds at once. You can come back to the mind as, you know, this kind of free and ultimate absolute being and yet be a conscious human individual. The world that we're all living in, in many ways, every part of it is just a metaphor for what it is. And yet, at the same time, none of us can really say what it is. It's not that it's crazy. It's not that you're not clever enough to say it yet. It's that language doesn't stick to it because the principles that language is built on don't have the same first principles as what I'm talking about. So the only way that you can get at it is to make a sphere around it. So here's a metaphor, and here's a metaphor, and here's a metaphor, and here's a metaphor, and here's a metaphor. And you make points on the sphere until eventually you can see what it's surrounding. And that's it. And somehow all of these things, or it's what they all have in common. Now what do all of these metaphors have in common? So neuroscience, neurobiology, functional MRIs, those are metaphors for an experience. And art and philosophy and religion are metaphors for an experience. And so when we talk about finding an answer in one place, I just don't think that's realistic. And I think that that is the benefit of integrating these studies into a university where the purpose is to come at questions of life, the universe, and everything from many different ways of understanding things as human beings. This is no hallucination. This isn't something that, that anybody can say didn't happen. This is the physical manifestation of something that we all know is true. If I could put an intention out there, I would love for Psychodemia to be hosted by a different university on a rotating basis so that we can take the energy and enthusiasm that's been generated by this conference and turn it into something sustainable and ongoing. controversy whatsoever over the event. There was a range of reactions, um, some uh, kind of surprised curiosity at one extreme, and then at the other extreme would be um, outright enthusiasm. There was almost zero pushback from anybody. We got funding from the medical school, we got funding from student groups, we got support you know, the hall that we did the event in, we organized through the student union and they let us use it for free. 
there was just never an issue. It was never like, this is something weird or something wrong or something taboo that you shouldn't be doing. It's just, it was always just accepted. I hope that this is the beginning of a much larger odyssey and I'm excited to see what comes in the future.